to sing this morning. So that's, uh, that is good. Um, but also I'm glad you are here, glad we were to gather together here today. Um, and just a, a quick announcement, we will be not having our in-person worship uh, for, well, starting as of 8 o'clock this evening or so after our evening worship service. Um, however, the, as you can see, Mark here is uh, going to be, he's going to video this service so that we can give a shot and see how this turns out. Um, we're going to be putting stuff on YouTube, so there will be links from our website, um, possibly on Facebook as well. I'm not exactly sure how all the technology works, but that's okay. I don't need to know there are people who know, and they're not me, and we'll utilize that. Um, and we're looking at some future possibilities in the next couple of weeks um, to still be able to bring people together, but in a manner that's not violating any rules of how many people are all those kind of things. So we're working on all of that. Um, and again, our, our main concern is that we're able to worship, that we're able to be together as the people of God, whether it's together here or together, you know, in our houses across the, the area, either way. And we give thanks for all those who potentially might be joining us through, uh, through our video services as well. Um, but also that we want to keep everybody safe. So uh, just as for your information, everything yesterday uh, afternoon, uh, the and everything was wiped down from entry to entry and uh, cleaned and with uh, antiseptic wipes and all those kinds of things. So um, it should be safe and good. Uh, so, uh, and we will be having communion. We did on Sunday, but we did a spaced out the wine across the tray so you can take it without touching other cups. So it should be, should be able to do that. And Mark, during that time, you be able to assist with communion? Sure. Thank you. Um, I just realized I'm by myself with that, so, and I'm, I'm not so good with two at once, so, um, so we were very focused on making sure, again, to reduce any possibilities of transmission, um, so let us, uh, begin our worship together this day, and for, again, those who, uh, might be joining us by video to, uh, join as we sing, Change My Heart, O oh God.
and we have our readings for this day. As we continue our, our questions, um, our first lesson is from Exodus, the 20th chapter. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord your God, and you shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male, or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And our second reading comes from the Gospel of John, the 18th chapter. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your laws. The Jews replied, We are not allowed to put anyone to death. Our question that we came to for today is if the Jewish people had the law, and the law says do not kill, why did the high priest and the others uh, and others turn Jesus over to the Romans for crucifixion? Why were the prophets and disciples killed? Well, <laughs> um, I'll turn to Pastor Justin. Oh, wait, no, no, just kidding. The, uh, he was, was going to send me his answer. No, no. The, uh, but to look at that question, we have the Ten Commandments we see in, that is spelled out in, in the book of Exodus for us this morning. And oftentimes when we hear the Fifth Commandment, and depending on how they're numbered sometimes, there can be a little variation depending on, uh, depending on what your faith tradition is. There can be a little variation on some of these. But the Fifth Commandment says, as many of us grew up, I grew up with being told the wording of it was, you shall not kill. The more accurate, as we find in our reading from Exodus today, is you shall not murder. Right. You shall not murder. Uh, and there's a difference. Obviously, there's a difference between these two. The difference in that regard, murder is intentional. Murder is an intentional killing, and using a legal definition, intentional killing with uh, malice aforethought. So it's an intentional act that you plan out and you commit. So even in our legal system, we have different degrees of murder, usually referring to was it more spontaneous, how much was it planned out, all those different types of things. Killing, however, can be accidental. You could back out of a parking spot and run somebody over. Somebody tried to do that to me the other day. I stopped and they decided to run a stop sign. And I was just, a, if I would have taken one more step, she would have just, she was even looking. She was looking to the side, would have just run me over. And I would have lost that battle because it was a three-quarter ton truck. I definitely would have lost. And I did yell, hey, that's called a stop sign, but I don't think she heard me. <laughs> maybe the, the car after her, though, I think maybe stopped that after that. Um, but that would have been accident. It would have been intentional. So that would have been a killing. Or uh, 
you know, back in those days, maybe you'd have like a camel accident, two camels collide, a person falls off and dies. It's not intentional. So killing can happen, even though it's not murder. Um, and uh, even think of cases such as self-defense. Somebody is protecting their life or protecting the life of somebody else. We could say a police officer, somebody is holding somebody hostage at gunpoint and is going to shoot that person. A police officer shoots the person who is committing the crime. We wouldn't call that murder. It would still be a killing, but it wouldn't be murder. So uh, there's a difference there. And I think it's important for the commandments to see because there is killing that does take place in the scriptures uh, and is not condemned as a murderous act. However, maybe it was different with Jesus. In the Torah, there's about, and to be honest, in reading the passages and then reading commentary from people, there's 26 to potentially 28 different laws that can bring about the death penalty. So there's about 26 on the very low end and maybe 28 on the high end. 27 seems to be kind of the more common one as death for punishment for a crime. And so a crime such as idolatry could warrant execution. Murder could warrant execution. Blasphemy, child sacrifice, kidnapping, uh, a disobedient son can be punished with death. There's some of these I might go, no, I'm just kidding. In case my son sees this, I'm only kidding about. But this will be inside. It is one of them. It actually is one. Now, the reality, though, in actual practice, capital punishment was rarely used by the Jews. It was not often that somebody was executed for idolatry or blasphemy. Murder might have been a little bit higher. But in child disobedience, basically, they didn't kill anybody because the child disobeyed their parents. It was just the idea of being a little bit more of a scare tactic, if you will, you know, so that people can understand the severity of the action, the severity of their disobedience, that they could be put to death. Uh, but generally, that wasn't happening. I was reading in, uh, from the Talmud that said uh, a high priest who puts someone to death for any crime once every seven years is incredibly strict and severe. So you can get the idea that it's not very common. This is not their chosen method to deal with problems that people have. But those laws did exist, and those punishments were prescribed in the scripture. So even when we read the woman who was going to be stoned to death in the Gospel of John, and Jesus intervenes, it did happen. It's just it wasn't very common. By the way, in the case of adultery, uh, part of it, some of them, depending on how the adultery was committed, uh, both parties could be executed. So both the male and the female could be. Uh, so uh, there was some parity there for both men and women. Women often got the, the worst deal in those situations, but um, there was punishment for men as well. Uh, so typically a blasphemer or idolater, more a blasphemer, might be more likely to be executed, which is kind of the, the, the uh, what Jesus is being accused of by the high priest, by the, the, the Jewish leaders. Um, so anybody who would be speaking negatively or falsely about God um, or speaking in God's name errantly was a blasphemy. And blasphemy could be punished by death. The Jews at that time, because of the Roman occupation, were not allowed to execute. So even though they may have had a law that way, the Romans said, you just can't do that. You're not allowed to fulfill, even if your, your law says that, Although the Romans did oftentimes let people do locally implement their laws, they often didn't interfere. But in this case, they, the, the Jews had already been difficult for the Romans, and so um, they were a little maybe more restricted on what they were able to do. Uh, so they saw Jesus potentially as a blasphemer. And if a blasphemer was so selected by the high priest or Pharisees for punishment, the punishment could be death. And we see that in even the prophets of old. When Jesus talks about, you've stoned the prophet, you've killed. Well, a lot of times what the prophets would do is say things that people didn't like. They would say things that ran afoul of whatever the king wanted, ran afoul of what some of the religious leaders wanted to do or what they were teaching. And so, what better way to stop a dissenting voice than an execution? 
I mean, you kill someone, they will not say anything more that you disagree with. That will end that. And that's often how that was used. We use it to shut up dissent. So now if the priests truly believed that Jesus was committing blasphemy, they would have been well within their right to demand his execution. That's what the law says. That's what the, the Torah says. They, they could ask for him to be executed because he was committing a crime that was a, what we would call a capital crime. However, is that why they wanted to kill Jesus? Did they fully believe that he was blaspheming? Or were they afraid? Were they afraid that Jesus was going to take away what they had? That he would take their power? That he would lead their people away from them? That he would take away all that respect and honor that they received from the people of Israel because of their position? Would he lay them low in a sense because of what he was doing, what he was saying? And if that were the case, then instead of it being an, a killing based in the law, it would be murder. So if they decided that you know, we got to get rid of Jesus because he's a threat to us and our positions, and they killed him, that would be murder. That would not be, and not be right. That would be a breaking of the law on their own. Which, of course, if they committed murder, they could be punished by execution. So, so it would kind of come back around on them in that sense. But it's, it's an interesting story, I think, when we look at it. So the question of well, why, would, why did they kill Jesus, well, if they really said he's blaspheming, they were following the law. I don't know that that's what they believed. And Jesus in the parable, when he talks about the workers in the vineyard who the, the owner of the vineyard sends messengers to them and they beat the messengers and throw them out and then finally the, the owner says, I'll send my son. They'll listen to my son. They're not going to do anything to him. And they, they gather together and say, you know what? If we just kill the son, then it's all ours. Because that, that logically makes sense, doesn't it? Hmm. If you owned a property and you had people working there, you had a farm and you had people farming, and you sent your son there and they killed him, of course you would give all the land to the people, right? I mean, that would be, that's a logical conclusion. Well, of course, if we kill God's son, well, then he'll give us all the stuff. We can be in control of everything. It doesn't make any sense at all. It was logically, uh, you know, quite a, quite a dissonant conclusion that they come to uh, in that the, in the cacophony of voices who are lifting up, you know, crucifying him makes no sense because I'm pretty sure if you killed my son and thinking that you're going to get his inheritance, so to speak, I'm not going to let that end well for you. That's just where I'm at. I don't think God was going to be overly pleased with that as an action. Yet, we do find a gracious God in the midst of all of this, and God's mercy and forgiveness. So, the high priests, as far as we can see, the high priests in the Jewish religion really kind of twist the law in such a way that benefits them, that suits their purposes, so it allows them to potentially tear down Jesus and this is, again, something I think that we see fairly commonly in the world as to how we do things. We word things in such a way that it suits us. Matter of fact, if we've been, of course, some of you may be aware there's a virus that is going around that there's some concern about. I don't know if you've heard of that, but um, that's been going on. And there's a letter from Martin Luther. Martin Luther lived during, basically, kind of the second one of the plagues in Germany, through where he was at in Germany. So about 200 years earlier, a little less than 200 years before Luther, um, the plague had ravaged Europe. Well, it came back and it threw him, not a surprise, it seems to happen. And while he is there, he is asked the question, is it okay to flee a plague? Is it okay for Christians to flee the plague? And if you are, I was talking with, with Pam, who said she doesn't get on social media, which is probably right now one of the smartest things to do is to avoid that, like the plague, um, because it is the greatest source of disinformation, I think, that you can possibly find. No offense to Facebook if it ends up under your wonderful uh, product and we're all amazed by it. But um, there's so much that comes out that isn't helpful and panic-inducing right now and all of that. But part of that is, 
Um, there's a VLCA clergy section, and again, I'm not attacking my brothers or sisters in that. And they're quoting a part of this letter from Luther. And part of it, he says, basically, I would, you know, in this situation, I would pray and fumigate and use all medications and do everything I can. And part of it, he says, I do everything I can not to spread this and not to intentionally put myself in a dangerous situation I don't have to be in to spread this disease. Luther was very, very, actually, Luther's understanding of, of medicine and, and cleanliness, and actually, was fairly advanced for considering the time period that he was living in. Um, but they leave out the section of the letter where he talks about Christians who said, we're going to stay here, and he commends them for staying, and he commends, he actually has, tells the clergy, you don't go anywhere. Unless there's more than enough clergy to handle every need in the area, you all stay put and minister to people who are ill. But we don't quote that part of the letter, because it doesn't suit my needs. So I want to prove to everybody that I should, you know, run away from this. So I only quote the one section and I leave the rest out. And that's kind of what happens in many ways with Jesus. Pilate doesn't see a reason to crucify him, but he also, Pilate says, you know, I don't have a good reason to do this, but if the Jews get worked up again, I'm going to lose my position, I'm going to lose my power and authority, if it just means killing one guy who's causing some trouble, and just take care of it. That's Pilate's attitude. I don't see a reason, but yeah, man, this is a term that goes. It doesn't affect me any really. We'll get rid of the guy. That'll solve all our problems. We're going to be happy again. Um, and that's what we do. We take things and make them fit our narrative, our scenario, and then beat each other with those things at times. And oftentimes it's done just simply out of fear. And I think that's what we see right now. It's just so many responses driven out of a fear and a panic. Not that, again, please don't take that to say, I don't think we should take caution, that we should do things in the right way. There's, there's good things we should be doing and that people are doing to keep themselves and others safe. I think that's important. I think it's important always. Ideally, we should always be practicing things like good hand washing. And if you're sick, stay home. Don't infect other people. All those things are things we should be doing with, with any disease because even the flu, as much as it may not be as uh, the mortality rate, rate might be less with the flu, it can be very dangerous to certain people. And we should want to keep people safe. And that's basically kind of what Luther says. But I think that we're driven so much by that fear. That same fear, I think, that made the Jewish leaders put Jesus to death and turn him over to the Romans. Uh, so why did they, why did Jesus, why did they kill Jesus? Even though the law says do not murder because they made it at least in their own minds not murder. We're doing it for the benefit of everyone even though really they were doing it for the benefit of themselves. They wanted to push God out. They didn't need God. They could do it better. They wanted their power. They wanted their authority. They wanted all those things. But that's not the path they were called to walk. But the greatest part of the story, I believe, in Jesus' execution, as Jesus is crucified, is his response. The response of God to us, which is, as people nail him to the cross, what does he say? God, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing. They don't understand. His prayers are forgiveness. What is God's heart towards us? When we twist things to our own device, when we try to make things for us and shut other people out, even when we buy 5,000 bowls of toilet, what was, it, or what was the hand sanitizer? 18,000 bottles of hand sanitizer, because we're going to take it and make an advantage for us. I still believe God meets us with forgiveness. I think correction too, but God does discipline us as well. But God, his final word to us is forgiveness and love and life. And so even though we look at a crucifixion as a tragic occurrence, which it definitely is, we get to see in that moment how deep God's heart is in the depth of his love for all of us, of what he was willing to do and the greatness of his forgiveness and life, again, that are poured out for us, and that we hear from the cross. For those who nail Jesus to a cross, for those who are lawbreakers, for those who are disobedient, Christ meets us with life and forgiveness. Amen.